17. The Atonement. Hebrews 8, 6 to 13. But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. For, finding fault with him, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind, and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbour, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. In that he saith, A new covenant he hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. Hebrews 8, 6-13 In verse 6, the premises are bold and clearly startling ones for devout Hebrews. Jesus Christ the Mediator represents, quote, a more excellent ministry, end quote, a, quote, better covenant, end quote, and one, quote, established upon better promises, end quote. Clearly, the covenant made by Moses was in some sense imperfect because it was not the final one. The proof for this statement is then cited, Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34, which plainly states that a better covenant will in due time be made. But what changed? God's law does not change, nor did God suddenly annul the law given by Moses. The change was that the mediator was now God the Son, Jesus Christ, not Moses. And the atonement made by him was not a typical one, but the sacrifice of himself. Hebrews at times uses the word covenant and at other times testament. The reason for this is that familiarity with the word covenant had come in time to obscure its unilateral nature. It was totally the work of God given to man whose only part in it was to receive it. Even man's reception of the covenant was made by the grace of God. The use of the word testament strengthened this fact the Greek word means will as in, quote, last will and testament, end quote. According to F.S. Rankin in a Greek will, quote, the contradictions of inheritance were, indeed, in the first place at the sole discretion of the testator, but it was publicly and solemnly executed, and thereupon at once became absolute, irrevocable and unalterable, end quote. The use of the word testament thus gave a finality to the covenant. The covenant made of old, fully set forth through Moses, now had its finality through the great mediator Jesus Christ, whose atoning death ratifies and validates the ancient covenant. The true mediator has come. He has made the sacrifice himself, and the covenant now has its final form. In the making of a covenant, in addition to the two parties involved, there must be a law and there must be the shedding of blood. The law had already been given by God from heaven to Moses. Now the sacrifice, the Lamb of God, John 1.36, had come from heaven to make atonement for the sins of his people, the new human race born again in him. Hebrews then cites Jeremiah 31.31-34. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenants that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenants they break, although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts, and write it in their hearts, and will be their God, and they shall be my people. 
and they shall teach no more every man his neighbour and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. In verse 8, God is spoken of as, quote, finding fault with them, that is, Israel. The covenant was good, but Israel was not. Therefore, a new covenant must be made, new in that another people will replace Israel. The twelve apostles replaced the twelve patriarchs, the sons of Jacob or Israel, to indicate that, while there was continuity, new peoples would be grafted into Abraham's stock, John 15, 1-6. Romans 11, 15 to 24. God's covenant is the same one he made with the patriarchs, but new in that another people now replaces most of Israel. There is, however, a marked difference, verse 9 tells us, between the covenant made by Moses and that made by Jesus Christ. With the covenant at Sinai, God demonstrated in very remarkable and miraculous ways his redeeming power towards Israel but they were rebellious and faithless. With this new covenant, God now writes his covenant and the covenant law in the hearts of his people. Verse 10, God gives the law to their minds and writes it on their hearts. It is now not only God's law, but also the very personal law of his people. The law was then engraved on tablets of stone, now in the life and flesh of his people. Paul well, speaks of this in 2 Corinthians 3, 7 to 18. The Holy Spirit indwells Christ's new human race in a way surpassing his presence in the Old Testament era. Because God's law now indwells his people, he is fully their God and they are his new human race. 1 Corinthians fifteen forty five following. When the fullness of this change triumphs, then, in the words of Isaiah eleven nine. 9, Quote, they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. End quote. In that time of victory, all men shall know the Lord. Quote, From the least of them to the greatest of them. Jeremiah 31 34. Why will there be greater knowledge, victory, and power? It arises out of God's grace and mercy whereby, through Christ, their sins are forgiven and forgotten, and they are truly freed from the curse and its power. Verse 12. The foundation for a renewed mankind and a cleansed world is the atonement by Jesus Christ. The Hebrews are told that the great victory and renewed earth foreseen by the prophets is totally dependent on Jesus Christ's high priestly work. His atonement allows the regenerating power of the triune God to complete God's creative purpose. To reject Jesus Christ as high priest is to reject his atonement and to abandon his victory. The Old Covenant, verse 13 tells us, is ready to vanish away forever. The Jewish-Roman War, AD 66-70, destroyed Israel in the temple. To cling to the high priesthood of Aaron was to insist on dying with that order. In the new order, God's covenant law would not be merely external, but also fully internal. Clearly, in Psalm 119, the psalmist demonstrates how intensely internalized the law was before Christ. The difference was the atonement and the radical forgiveness of sins. The nagging handicap of sin and the lingering problem of a troubled conscience give way to freedom in Christ. Antinomians see the law as a burden and penalty rather than sin as the disappearing element and they thereby warp the meaning of the atonement. It is not the law that disappears but the old sacrificial system and its priesthood. Christ's atonement gives freedom and power. <laughs>